to be here today because um, what I do is spend a lot of time speaking to kind of academics and companies, but it really is you guys that matter. Let me tell you how I got interested in this area. It's kind of a personal story. I'm an only child, so I'm super close to my cousin, Alexia, who um, is just wonderful and gorgeous in every way. And when she was about 13, she developed a skin condition called vitiligo. Does anyone know what that is? color on your skin. It's a deep pigmentation source. You can imagine you kind of get white patches and she's got kind of my skin tone. So you can imagine how that must have looked. And it was amazing to me because I saw Alexia going from being this really open, smiley, ambitious, extremely person to walking around like this, speaking very quietly. And I will never forget how much it impacted me. I couldn't get that that's all of what she saw in the mirror now. And, um, and so when I went off to study and did my master's and my doctoral work, I did two things. I studied um, body image, how what we look like makes us feel, and I studied psychoneuroimmunology, how the way we think affects our body. So I kind of looked at how our, our thoughts affect our, our immune system and hormones and skin disease, but also looked very much into how our appearance affects the way not only people perceive us, but very, very, very importantly, the way we perceive ourselves. Um, since then, I've become a mom to a little girl, so that makes it even more important to me, because just the idea that Jessica would ever look in the mirror and not see how wonderful she is breaks my heart, and it does so for, for any girl out there. So that's why I do what I do. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, is what main issues of body image are. I'll try and explain to you what psychologists conceptualize it as. Um, we're going to speak a little bit about objectification and then some ideas for a possible body image curriculum. Okay, so firstly, body image isn't based on fact. It's not like one of those tangible things. It's based on a group of thoughts and ideas and feelings. So really, it's based on every message you've ever gotten from mommy saying, oh, you've got legs like Auntie to magazines telling you, you know, that thin is in, to, to friends, as we were talking about before, to sitcoms, to movies. All of these things kind of feed into our subconscious. And so when we look in the mirror, we're not seeing us. Imagine we're seeing us through glasses, and all of those glasses are smeared on what you've been told by your family, what you've been told by fairy tales, what magazines tell you, what TV tells you, if you've ever been bullied. So you're never really clearly looking at you. You're looking at all those messages and those things are affecting the way you see yourself. So psychologists define body images as a person's thoughts, perceptions, and feelings about their body. Thoughts, perceptions, and feelings. So this is vital in terms of understanding why we see what we see and why it's so important to kind of raise the major issues that are going on. I'm going to give you some statistics. 69% of female television characters are thin. Only 5% overweight. And interestingly, those 5% that are overweight are usually the ones that are seen as kind of pathological, as the fun fat kid, as the fat girl that never gets the date. So it's, it's not that those associations aren't there. It's when they are there, they're there, but there are sort of negative connotations associated. The average person sees between 400 and 600 ads per day. That's everything from TV, radio, buses, everywhere. That is 40 to 50 million by the time he or she is 60. One of every 11 commercials has a direct message about beauty. This is not counting the indirect ones. So imagine how many shoulds and have tos you are bombarded with day in, day out. And that's not to mention the stuff that you kind of is supposed to seep into the subconscious there. Um, recent uh, large-scale study found body dissatisfaction to be increasing at a faster rate than ever before, with almost 90% of almost 3,500 respondents saying they wanted to lose weight. They wanted to assert control. They wanted to change. They wanted to modify. 13 million people in the UK are effectively on a permanent diet. They're always trying to adapt what they eat to, to lose weight. Two in five of these are women, whereas only one in six are men. In a study of almost 500 schoolgirls, 81% aged 10 years old reported they had dieted at 
least once. Now this is interesting as well because what we're seeing clinically as well is that um, girls increasingly younger are having eating disorders and body image disturbance. Now this is not something um, that we saw 10, 15 years ago, yet increasingly we are seeing this. Um, interestingly, someone mentioned parents before and the effect of moms. One of the other things we know is that if your mom doesn't like her body and is always talking about diets and is always obsessing about how she looks, a lot of that is learned behavior. Because the message you're getting sent is, well really your value lies in being pretty and thin, right? That's obviously the most important thing. That's the message. And if mommy's doing it, it's much, much more likely that you will be as well. Researchers have found that the average size of idealized women as portrayed by models has become progressively thinner and has stabilized to 13 to 19% below physically expected weight. 13 to 19% below physically expected weight and it's just getting lower and lower and lower. Now, the thing is that, that gets me is how we have managed to distill our worth as girls just down to how we look. Doesn't matter how smart we are, doesn't matter how funny we are, doesn't matter what we're passionate about, how fast we run, how high we jump, it comes down to how we look. And the more girls, and, and there's a lot of research again um, coming out from girls' decisions um, in choice, of, of the jobs, of the careers they aspire to. And whereas we used to have a much nicer, wider spread around what girls aspire to, now it seems to be very, very uniform into things that are associated with appearance and beauty. In fact, one of the most shocking studies that I, um, that I read in recent years was a thousand girls um, aged 15 to 19 who were asked what their ideal job would be. And this was from a list that had things like teacher and doctor in, Almost a quarter said lap dancer would be the ideal job. Almost 50% said glamour model. The fact that women earn more money than men in only three job categories, three job categories, modeling, pornography, and prostitution, punctuates the idea that the way we are valued, what we're teaching you guys, is that that's what's important about you. That's where your value lies. That's where you should commodify. So why is it a bigger issue for girls? Um, well, when I go to schools and I speak to girls, it's really interesting. I kind of say, when I speak to boys and girls, actually, and I say, name sort of a few famous men. And invariably, they'll say things like Barack Obama, who's a politician, or uh, David Beckham, who's a footballer. I even get Donald Sugar, who's a businessman. With, with women, with girls, I say, name a famous woman. What do you think is the woman that most girls speak about in the UK? Jordan. Are you kidding me? Jordan. Jordan. Why is that? Who here can name uh, three female athletes? And I bet if I asked to name three male athletes, it would happen much quicker. Same to do with politicians, same to do with businessmen. Why is that? Who do we give the awards to in this world? We award men for playing sports. We constantly validate them for kind of competing in political aspirations, for doing business. For girls, we award them for being pretty. <laughs> that's like so important. It's like so difficult. We award them for singing. We award them for dressing really nicely. Who wore it best? Ugh. You know, we are not teaching, I think we're, you know, as girls, we're letting, as women, we're letting ourselves down if we kind of think the most important thing about us is the thing, actually, that is going to go. Even if you are pretty, it ain't going to last. <laughs> it goes pretty quickly. So that, if you're putting all your self-esteem eggs in the beauty basket, big trouble in a few years ago. <laughs> I think we spoke, it was interesting something about this before, about competition. Um, and oh, it was when we were doing the, the line exercise, right? And it was, who do you feel worse about um, judging you, men or women, right? Now there's some interesting work that, um, that looks at how men and women compete. And again, in our 
society, men compete very overtly, right? If you think about football matches and boxing, even political races, they tend to be quite male. Women, on the other hand, were not socialized into competing the same way. What major group sport, group female sport, is out there? When has there been a major political contest between two females? What we do compete on, what we are taught, is to compete covertly. So we'll walk into a room, we'll look around, we'll say, okay, if I'm about a six, who's a seven and who's a three? Who am I prettier than? Who am I not prettier than? And I know a lot of people find it difficult to admit, again, but there is evidence that that's what we do. There's evidence around social matching theory that we kind of walk in and we try and assess where we stand in relation to other women. And that punctuates relationships in a really unhealthy way, because if I'm competing with you, it's going to be really hard for us to collaborate and make, you know, do a great research proposal and change the world, right? Because all we're thinking about is, you know, what's your bra size or what's your, you know, whatever size. <laughs> Okay. There's a great quote by John Berger, who famously said, Men look at women. Women watch themselves being looked at. And this determines not only the relations of men to women, but sadly, the relations of women to themselves. So, as I was saying, every woman around us becomes our competition, vying for the same resources we were after until our relationships are no longer punctuated with sisterhood like they should be, but in terms of competition and rivalry. Thus, the magazines of, ha ha, she's got more cellulite than me. I'm a better person than um, okay, so where are we today? Well, we have now reached a point where we are seeing eating disorders in children as young as four. I was referred an eight-year-old last year with a serious eating disorder, something I've been in this area for many years, and it was shocking. The average age of anorexia is consistently dropping. Young women are literally starving themselves to death in the name of beauty. Um, in fact, more women die of eating disorders than uh, car accidents and illnesses put to, together from the ages of uh, 16 to 22. So, how have we gotten here? Well, so as we were saying, body image develops um, during, let's take a developmental point of view. So when we're babies, right, and we kind of, we're getting to know the world in the beginning, we don't really know where we start and where the world ends. So baby isn't really even aware that its crib isn't part of it. So there's no real kind of clear definition of who they are. You know, slowly as they develop, they become clear about who they are, and they kind of get validation from whom do you think? Who's their a baby's first mirror? Their mummy. Yeah. So if your mummy looks at you and smiles at you and gives you a lot of that wonderful reinforcement and validation, baby thinks, oh, I'm pretty cute. I'm <laughs> pretty good. I quite like me. I really like that's cool. Um, so this mirroring that parents do increases the child's understanding of social relationships. And as soon as they begin to recognize their parents' actions reflect their own, they begin to build up you know, a more positive image of themselves. They begin to build up an image in general of themselves. Now, as early as 14 months, they can begin to actually shy away from the mirror. So around this age, a child becomes aware that it actually exists separate um, from everything else, and that mummy isn't the mirror anymore. And this is when things, as children get older, so they get into toddler years, and five, and six, and seven, where all those things that we don't really think about actually begin to matter. If every book you read a little girl tells her that the princess who has all the good qualities is pretty and smart and charming, and the witch, what's the witch? Ugly. Of course she's ugly. She's ugly on the outside and ugly on the inside. So we read them those stories. We then we also read them stories about having to be saved by boys. I know that's another lecture, but I would so like to go there. You know, <laughs> um, you know these things kids take on. Even at a really young age, they listen to it. The way that they're compared to their brothers and sisters. I'm, like I said, I'm an only child, but it you know, never ceases to amaze me when parents be like, she's the athletic one, and oh, she's the dancer. And I'm like, oh my gosh, just imagine how our parents, out of no will of doing anything wrong, begin to define us. And those definitions are taken and they're integrated into our own self-concept. And some of those things are positive, some are negative. Toys and games are a big one. Do you guys know what brat stalls are? Yeah. Is anyone else as appalled at brat stalls as I? They're like baby prostitutes, are they not? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to give their the fish nets and the holy? Anyway, um, so. And Barbie. So 90% of 
girls, age 3 to 11, have a Barbie doll. This is one of the first idealized images we give to a child. Do you know if, if she was kind of brought up to adult proportions, she wouldn't be able to stand up and her organs would actually fall out because there'd be no space for some of them? Literally, if you were to blow her up. But this is one of the first images we give to our little girls and say, there you go. And do you know, I remember when I was little, a long time ago, my mom, um, and I wanted a doll that wasn't blonde. I remember thinking, are, are all pretty, are all dollies blonde? And my mom tried so hard and took her a really long time to find a doll that looked like me. How many dolls do you guys think look like you? So right from start, forget magazines, forget movies. Here you go. Here's something that has no bearing to reality. Beyond that, I think what's happening these days, the message isn't about just young girls being pretty. I think the worrying thing is, is that we're teaching you guys that your desire lies in your ability to be desired. So all the Facebook likes, all the you know, posing so that people will like what you look like. Almost half of elementary school kids, as I said earlier, want to be thinner. And four out of five are afraid of being fat. But at the same time, what we're doing is we're teaching girls to become objectified. Look at the poses of these little girls. Where do you think they're learning that? This doesn't happen by accident. Everywhere you look, the pouty image, the available, the kind of showing you, the positioning your body, the bombardment of this is what you ought to look like. This is what you ought to be, is everywhere. And huge brands, I mean, <laughs> Playboy is a huge pornography brand that completely objectifies women, that teaches us that women are there to be used. And that is put on kids' notebooks and pencils. We've spoken about Brad dolls. This is a lap dancing, uh, pole dancing kit available in toy shops. So there also seems to be this one. It was until recently available in toy shops. And so again, this idea of, of kind of being available and being desirable is being thrown at girls at a younger and younger age. So we move, we've spoken about what it's like to be a child, then we move into adolescence. We have some great talks about what happens in adolescence. And that's a time when psychologically we become so much more self-aware. It's a time where our bodies are changing, so the need to assert control over this is hugely important. You start wondering what group do I belong in? I'm not quite little, I'm not quite grown up. My body's doing stuff I don't know. I don't understand, um, but at the same time, I know what it should look like, I know what it ought to be doing, I know what is valued. More than anything, this is the time we examine ourselves in relation to other people. So our self-image is challenged, and we begin to take a closer look at our appearance. And as we meet you people who like us, or we feel are important, we begin to measure ourselves against them. Um, just drawing on from the last talk, because I do a lot of stuff in psychodermatology, I was reading a really interesting study about kids with acne and kids without acne. And uh, we're looking at career aspirations. And they found that kids with acne, even though they oftentimes had better marks than kids without acne, would apply to lower graded universities. So it's almost as we f begin to feel that we don't deserve something. And this is a problem. We buy into this beauty myth that to be successful and happy and have good relationships, I need to be beautiful. And it's this self-fulfilling prophecy that's a big reason of why we're seeing a lot of the statistics we are. If we expect something to happen, we bring it about. If I don't think you're going to like me because of the color of my hair, I'll probably like not make really good eye contact with you and be like, hi, how are you doing? And you're not going to make great eye contact with me back and probably won't like me after all. But if I think, actually, I quite like who I am, and I smile and I talk, then all of a sudden that goes away. Um, there's a, I remember when I was doing my doctoral research, I met an amazing man named James Partridge. And James was um, in a very bad car accident and was very badly burned. And um, when I met him, I've got to say, within a minute of speaking to him, I could not see a thing on his face. Why? Because the social skills, his ability to connect, his ability to see himself in a positive way and, and relay that was so great that 
the way he looked became secondary, so unimportant. And this is what we were talking about before, that yes, when you show someone two-dimensional pictures of who's prettier, then you are going to have all those social biases. But you know what moderates all those biases? Personality, intellect, the way you talk, the way you connect, the way you feel about the world. That's what moderates all that. But sadly, if we're not taught that, what are we going to do when we feel low? We're going to get plastic surgery, we're going to get more makeup, we're going to wear tight, I don't know, whatever. We're going to change the way we look rather than actually the stuff will affect our self-esteem or affect our social skills. Okay. Speaking of plastic surgery, um, two-thirds of 16-year-old girls in high school have known someone who's undergone plastic surgery. And here's a really interesting stat as well. Um, up until about two years ago, the number one plastic surgery procedure for teenagers was rhinoplasty, nose jobs. Do you want to guess what the number one plastic surgery procedure for girls is today? <laughs> Breast implants. Because we've tweaked the message. The message is not only you have to be thin and beautiful, you have to be sexy. You've got to be sexually desirable. That's where your value lies. Forget your thoughts, forget your feelings, forget what you can change and do and better the world. That's what it lies. Alright, so what kind of girls and women find body issues the easiest to deal with? Well, what we found, what research shows, is those women that have, and girls that have good self-esteem, are the ones whose self-esteem is not just on reliance on how they look, which is much bigger, much wider. Um, my little girl, when, everyone's, uh, when I walk with her, and anyone says to her, oh my god, aren't you pretty? I also say, and she's really good at judo and math, which freakishly, she's really good at judo <laughs> and math. And I make a point of saying that. And the reason I make a point of saying that is because I don't want Jessica to think that that's the most interesting thing about her, because it's, it's, it's not, and it's something that's changeable. The messages you receive from people around you throughout your life will leave a lasting effect potentially on your body image. So it's consistently shown that people with good self-esteem, who like themselves for a wide variety of reasons, fare better at dealing with knockbacks relating to their body image. So they fare better after an accident, they even fare better after aging, after having, you know, gaining weight, all of these things. Self-esteem is the best defense against all those societal shoulds and have-dos that we grow up with. So, if I had my way and we could have a, a body image module, what are the things I think I'd love to, to learn myself and to teach girls? It's firstly to dispel the beauty myth. I spoke to you a while ago that my PhD was working with people with disfigurements. Well, one of the things that I learned very early on is that there's no correlation, there's no relationship between the the badness of a disfigurement and how you feel. What I mean by that is I had people sit across from me who had 60% burns, who had a much better body image than some of the models and actresses that I see today. So there's no correlation between how you look and how you feel about how you look. And if you hear nothing else today, guys, please hear this. It's all up here. Have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, I'm really cute, and then another day thought, well, not so much today. We have days like that? Do you think you physically change that much from day one to day two? What changes up here? What changes is someone has made a comment, you've seen something that's affected you, you're feeling unwell. All of these things punctuate how you see what you see in the mirror. The other thing we need to start talking about is that the concept of beauty varies widely from culture to culture, as we've already heard. I um, did my sort of my formative years were in Cyprus. And my grandmother constantly told me I'd never find a husband because I was so skinny. And like, what is your, look at you, you'll never find. And I hated that. I used to sneak weight gainer, the muscle behind my mother's back, wear two or three pairs of tights. I hated that. And then I went to, to Canada where skinny was valued. And I was finally, interestingly, able to gain weight. So I was able to relax about it. So there you go. But it's, it's such a culturally variable thing, the color of our skin. In this country, we spend millions browning our skin with a fake tan. You go to Asia, they spend millions whitening their skin, because that's what's valued. We need to teach ourselves how to look in the mirror. 
Um, when scientists look at the way men and women look in the mirror, they use sort of these eye tracking things. Um, they find that there's a difference between boys and girls. Girls will look in the mirror and cut themselves up. So they'll be like, like my eyes, hate my nose, like my lips, hate my breasts, and so on and so forth. Men tend to look at the whole thing, the gestalt, the whole thing. And so men tend to consistently estimate in a much healthier way how they look, whereas women tend to consistently underestimate how they look. Now, one of the reasons that we cut ourselves up into pieces is because we've been socialized into doing this. We have dismembered, disembodied legs selling tights, lips selling lipstick, pieces of women, as if that's what we are, pieces of body parts. This is not the case for men. You don't see, a, you don't see them dismembered in the same way. So we need to learn how to look in the mirror. The other thing that we've been socialized to do is to fix things, to look in the mirror, see what we don't like, and then buy something to fix it, right? So I look in the mirror and I think I'm too pale so I ought to buy some blush. I look in the mirror and I think I'm too fat, I ought to buy some, something to help me lose weight, a gym membership. So there's a real sense that we have to learn how to look in the mirror and focus on what we like. And just try this. Every time you look in the mirror, do not leave until you find at least two things you like about yourself on that day. It's a really small thing, but it can make such a difference in what our focus is and therefore how we value ourselves. Because the big fear is, is if I look in the mirror and I say I don't like my legs, I don't my, like my legs turns into I don't like my appearance. I don't like my appearance turns into I don't like me. And that's where the problem lies because those are the cognitive errors, those are the jumps we make. And that's what we need to be careful of in store. We need to teach that changing one's appearance through cosmetic procedures only has a short-term effect on confidence and self-esteem. So we're not talking about corrective surgery here, right? We're talking about cosmetic surgery. And one of the reasons that people get addicted is yes, you do get an immediate high, but then what happens? Falls back down again, and you need some more and it falls back down again. And actually, if what I'm trying to fix is why I can't get the job, or the date, or the career, or the friends, ain't no amount of you know, breast implants, liposuction, that's going to fix that. It's going to come down to how I like me, to how I invest in me, to how I speak to people, to how I connect with them. I think it's also important that this we understand that this can change. You know, in our society, we manage to make great strides. I think right now we're in a really difficult time as women and as girls because I think we've taught ourselves that you know that's it, that's the most important thing. But if you think about it, in America, in sort of the, the racial movement, we went from Rosa Parks being asked to sit in the back of a bus to Barack Obama being voted in within five decades. That's huge. And why did that happen? Why did, that, why did that social change happen? Because people stopped becoming caricatures, African Americans stopped becoming caricatures of themselves, the way that women have to stop becoming caricatures of what they are, and we need to fight against it. So when someone tries to you know, distill you down to something as simple as how thin you are, or how smooth your skin is, this is when we need to say, actually, there's a lot more to me than that. There's a lot more I can do, a lot more I can say, there's a lot more I can think about. These are just some people that did it their way. I kind of find fascinating, again, when they say, well, these things can't change. Um, when Cindy Crawford, do you guys know Cindy Crawford? She was a big model back in the 80s. Um, and she had a mole here. And when she started modeling, people were like, oh, you got to get rid of the mole. And she said, no, I quite like my mole. Now, a lot of people saw it as a defect. She made that mole so famous that there was girls lining up to get tattoos of moles on her. She did that. <laughs> That's Sylvester Stallone. He was born with a birth defect, so that part of his lip was paralyzed. For years, he was told that he looks weird, you've got to have it surgically changed. He refused to do it. He became one of the, he's made some of the most famous movies. J-Lo and her curves. We've got women having bum implants now in South America because she said, this is me. This is the way I look. Kelly Brook, her lips, uh, Kelly LeBrock, rather, her lips were considered too big when she was modeling back in the 70s and 80s. And now it's one of the leading cosmetic surgery changes. And the reason that these people, I think, the reason I'm showing you these people is because they decided to redefine beauty on their own terms. 
thing is, one of the biggest problems we have today is that we keep bombarding you guys with one image of what is beautiful. But actually, we all have our own kind of beauty and we need to stop emulating anyone else. We need to celebrate our, our skin tone, our height, our shape, and make it work for us the way they did. You speak about media, media literacy just briefly. Um, a lot has been spoken about today about how you know it's everywhere. It's bombarded to us uh, by TV, by magazines. Um, we are shown more images today than at any other time in modern history. Any other time. You guys are being bombarded more than we ever thought possible. So what we need to do is we need to equip you with the skills to kind of filter through those messages. To filter through. So, you know, is buying the lip gloss really going to make you that much happier? Are the hair extensions going to be life changing? We need to be able to start challenging. And I believe media literacy is a vital part of any um, a campaign to try and look at body image and something that we are kids. I mean, something that I do with my little girl all the time. In fact, my husband was telling me, I think I've gone too far the other way. The other day, we're um, getting ready to go to a wedding and Jessica was sitting there with her hair all over the place. I'm like, Jesse, come let mommy do your hair. He's like, in a minute, mommy. Jesse, come let mommy do your hair. Mommy, in a minute. Jesse, mommy, it's what's on the inside that matters. <laughs> like, okay, honey, sometimes need hair is important. Come let me do your hair. So, um, but what my point is, is that it can be done. You know, and sometimes it's just about having those discussions. Ask your parents when you're sitting there watching a commercial. You know, next time you're sitting in front of the TV, have you bought into this? What are they really trying to say? Why are they using an actor or act that looks like this as opposed to a different way to try and sell the product? Not all campaigns are bad. I remember being involved in choosing the first group of Dove Girls. Um, and I think this did so well, this campaign, because it hit her. It said what we were all trying to say. So, in conclusion, we need to develop a self-esteem that is not reliant just on our appearance. It needs to be bigger. We need to stop buying into the beauty myth. We need to look into the mirror and focus on what we like as opposed to what we don't. Challenge the negative thoughts and negative media messages that we're bombarded with. Celebrate our own beauty rather than trying to emulate someone else's. And finally, don't distill our worth down to mere appearance, but celebrate intellect, creativity, and passion.